Here we are traveling east on Interstate 90 in the western part of South Dakota. We're on our way to the old western historic town of Deadwood Gulch. In 1874, gold was discovered by the expedition led by Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer. The 7th Cavalry was charged with finding a location for a fort and a way southwest through the Black Hills. They found a small amount of gold and word spread. During the next 125 years, 10% of the world's gold will be taken out of the Black Hills. Although the Black Hills of Dakota Territory was Sioux Indian land, guaranteeing that no whites would intrude by the 1865 Fort Laramie Treaty, but within two years of the mother load discovery, word quickly spread and prospectors, fortune hunters, outlaws, gamblers, and prostitutes began pouring into the makeshift mining camp of Deadwood. The population quickly reached 5,000 within a few months. The population today is only 1,300. Now you simply turn south on exit 17 off Interstate 90 onto Highway 80. Then it's only eight miles to Deadwood. Deadwood is located in a valley with mountains on three sides. Old timers call the Valley of Gulch. Of course, Deadwood is now a tourist town. And we're looking for the most popular historic spot in town, the location of the Nuttle and Man Saloon, known at the time simply as Saloon Number 10. Number 10 is located where the famous lawman, scout, and showman, Wild Bill Hecock, was shot and killed while playing cards. Now this is the way Deadwood looked in the early days. Mostly tents and wooden buildings with always muddy streets. The actual saloon and a large portion of the town was burned to the ground a few years after Hickok's death. As a matter of fact, there's been so many fires in and around Deadwood that old wood covers the ground and dead trees still stand among the new growth. Thus the name Deadwood. You're looking at the Nuttle and Man Saloon number 10. It is one of the most popular saloons in the country, especially with bikers and tourists. Now when Wild Bill arrived in 1876, he was already famous, but not rich. Wealth had eluded him and fame had become a burden. James Butler Hecock was born May the 27th, 1837, in LaSalle County, Illinois. He was the fourth of six children born on a farm to William Alonzo Hecock and his wife, Polly Butler. Like most youngsters in his day, Bill was taught how to use a gun. He quickly became an excellent shot and by the time he was in his teens, he was known as the best shot in LaSalle County. By the age of 18, Hickok was working for the railroad driving a mule team when he got into a fight with a co-worker by the name of Charles Hudson. The two ended up in the river trying to drown each other. As Bill was being pulled off of Hudson by other workers, someone shouted out, Hudson is dead. He wasn't, but Bill didn't wait to find out. He headed west to Kansas and Nebraska. Thinking that the law would be looking for him, he started using his father's name, William Hickok. Bill worked several jobs, finally becoming a stagehand in Rock Creek, Nebraska for the Overland Stage and the newly formed Pony Express Company. The express company had leased the land from the owner, David McCandless. Hurting for money, the company was behind on its lease payments. And on July the 12th, 1861, McCandless, along with two other men, and including his 12-year-old son, Munro, arrived at the express station to either receive payment 
or repossession. They asked to see Horace Wellman, the station manager. Now, what happened next is in question. What we do know is that David McCandless and two of his men ended up dead with his son escaping. One story says that Bill shot McCandless in cold blood while standing behind a quilt curtain as David entered the cabin. Some say that McCandless had been bullying Bill, calling him Duck Bill, referring to his long nose and protruding upper lip, instead of just plain Bill. And to make things worse, it was said that both men were interested in the same woman, Sarah Schulz. Some say that it was the station manager, Horace Wellman, that actually killed McCandless, and that Bill had wounded the other two men that had come to McCandless's aid. Some believe that a third person, J.W. Brink, working for Wellman at the station, actually was the one that killed the two men. However, a few years later, George Ward Nichols, writing for the Harper's New Monthly magazine, had Wild Bill killing ten men at the Rock Creek shootout, all with Wild Bill's blessing. After the shootout, Bill, along with Horace Wellman and J.W. Brink, were all three charged with murder. They were found not guilty on the grounds that they were protecting company property. The story goes that on their way to the trial, Bill demands that they stop by and apologize to McCandless's wife and give her money. Now, afraid that the nickname Duck Bill would stick, he began calling himself Wild Bill and grew a thick mustache to cover up his upper lip. The next five years, Hickok will serve the North as a spy, wagon master, and provost marshal during the Civil War. And in July of 1865, Bill ends up in Springfield, Missouri, where he had served as provost marshal. On July the 20th, Hickok was staying at the Lyons House Hotel playing cards when he was confronted by an ex-Confederate soldier by the name of Davis Tut. Bill owed Tut money from a previous gambling loss. They disagreed on the amount owed. Tut grabbed Hickok's watch that was laying on the card table and said, I'll keep the watch until the amount I say you owe is paid. Bill said, I'll pay my debt, but don't wear the watch in public. You see, as a gambler, it was really important that you pay your debts. And losing his watch to Tut was not only embarrassing to Bill, but could put in question his ability to pay his gambling debts. Tut said, I'll wear your watch wherever I please, even in the town square. Unable to work out a settlement, the next evening on the 21st, a little before 6 p.m., friends of Tut met Bill at the Lions Hotel where he was staying and taunted him saying that Davis Tut was in the town square wearing his watch. The friends of Davis actually thought that Davis was the better shot. Now, the Lions Hotel was located on South Avenue where the Systematic Savings Bank is now located. Bill left the lion's house walking towards where the flagpoles are now standing, where he spotted Tut. Davis was standing in front of the courthouse at that time, in the northwest part of the square. Bill warned Tut not to come across the square wearing his watch. And to show exactly how far they were, 75 yards or 225 feet, the lady is standing where Wild Bill was at at the time, and now the camera is turning back to where Tut was at, at the little round plate in the middle of the street. Both men stopped and drew their guns. Tut missed. Bill didn't. Both men fired one shot each. Tut stumbled back a few feet and fell on courthouse steps. A warrant was issued for Bill's arrest. He was tried for manslaughter, but found not guilty after a three-day trial because Davis Tutt 
initiated the fight, they said, by taking Bill's watch. And witnesses also stated that Hickok had made several attempts to avoid the fight. Sometime later, after hearing about the exceptional shot made by Wild Bill in Springfield, Colonel George Nichols, looking for stories to help circulation of his Harper's New Monthly magazine, began writing exaggerated stories about the exploits of Wild Bill Hickok. Soon Bill became famous as a straight-shooting pistolier from the stories printed in the Harper's Magazine in February of 1867. In August 1869, Wild Bill, James Butler Hickok, was elected the acting sheriff of Ellis County, that's Hayes City, Kansas, partly because of this fame from the Harper Magazine stories. During his first month in office, he shot and killed his first man as a law officer. Eyewitnesses stated that Bill Mulvey, while drinking and riding up and down the street, shooting up the town, stated that he had come to town to kill Bill. As Bill walked into the street to stop Mulvey, Mulvey, while sitting on his horse, cocked his rifle and pointed it at the sheriff. Hickok, at the same time, threw up his hands and looked past Mulvey and yelled, No, don't shoot him in the back, boys. He's been drinking. As Mulvey turned his horse to see who was behind him and discovering that he had been duped, Hickok draws his pistol and puts a bullet through Mulvey's head. The very next month, on September the 27th, around 1 a.m., Sam Strawhan, along with several friends, were wrecking one of the several saloons in Hayes. When Wild Bill and Deputy Peter Lanahan arrived, Sam refused to stop the ruckus. Now, it's not certain whether Sam threatened to shoot the sheriff or throw a glass in his face. One thing is sure, they buried Sam Strawhan the next day. At the coroner's inquest, Hickok said that he was trying to restore order. Several witnesses disagreed about the killing, but the jury found the killing justifiable. On July the 17th, 1870, Bill was attacked by two soldiers from the 7th U.S. Cavalry, Jeremiah Longergan and John Kyle. They attempted to fist fight Hickok when John Kyle pulled a gun and put it to Wild Bill's head and pulled the trigger. The gun snapped and fell to fire. Bill managed to pull his own revolver, killing Kyle and shooting Lonigan in the leg. Wild Bill stayed on guard for some time after that, thinking that other soldiers might come seeking revenge. On April 15, 1871, Wild Bill was elected town marshal of Abilene, Kansas. He replaced Marshal Tom Smith, who had been shot and killed in the line of duty from ambush on November 2, 1870. The town council ordered Marshal Hickok to clean out the brothels, which put him in conflict with the local cowboys. On October the 5th, 1871, around 9 p.m., Marshal Hickok walked out of the Alamo Saloon to put down a disorderly mob of drunken cowboys. Leading the group was a man by the name of Phil Cole. He was a gambler, gunman, and businessman. Wild Bill and Phil Cole had had several run-ins in the past, but this night Cole had fired a gun, which was against town ordinance. When Wild Bill asked for Cole's gun, Cole turned the gun toward Bill, firing twice. The first shot went into the sidewalk, where Bill was standing, and the second shot is said to have gone through Bill's coat. Marshal Hickok returned fire, putting two bullets into Phil Cole's stomach. He died two days later. Here in the gunplay, Mike Williams, a close friend and deputy marshal of Wild Bills, pulls his gun and heads towards the commotion, thinking that the marshal might be in trouble. Hickok, not knowing that it was his deputy and only seeing someone coming up behind him with a gun, Bill turns and shoots, killing Mike Williams, his own deputy. This mistake will affect Bill Hickok for the rest of his life. 
After Mike Williams is dead, Bill will never hold another lawman's position. It'll be his last gunfight. He will pay for Williams' funeral and ride all the way to Kansas City to explain to Williams' wife what happened. While Bill was Marshal of Abilene, he meets Agnes Thatcher Lake, a wealthy widow woman. Now this is Bill, Agnes, and her daughter Emma. Bill and Agnes will develop a friendship and will continue it by correspondence for the next few years. And they'll meet again while Bill was performing with the Buffalo Bill Cody Wild West show that he had joined after leaving Abilene. This time, friendship will turn to romance. Bill will soon grow tired of show business, and after a couple of years, he'll quit the Wild West show. He'll make a living off his fame and gambling tables. In the first part of 1876, Wild Bill was diagnosed by a Kansas City doctor as having glaucoma and trachoma, a disease that causes blindness. He was already losing his marksmanship. Not a good thing for a pistol air. In March of the same year, Bill was in Cheyenne, Wyoming, preparing to go to the gold camps in Deadwood, Dakota Territory. When Agnes Lake stopped in Cheyenne to visit friends on her way back from San Francisco, the couple quickly renewed their friendship. And on the 5th of March, 1876, James Butler Hickok marries Agnes Thatcher Lake. It was Wild Bill's first and only marriage at age 38. It was the second marriage for Agnes at the age of 49. The couple travels to Cincinnati, Ohio, where Agnes had a home. It was reported that Agnes had loved Bill for three years, but refused to marry him until her daughter was old enough to marry. She had planned to make them a home in Ohio. However, in June, after three months of marriage, Wild Bill leaves Ohio for Cheyenne. According to most accounts, he left Agnes in Ohio and went off to seek his fortune. Agnes stated that she could make good money performing in a circus, being that she had been a circus owner and performer from an early age. Hickok stated in a letter that he wanted her to perform only for him and not the public. Some Deadwood historians believe that Agnes was actually staying in Cheyenne waiting for Bill to return and not in Ohio. Hickok was planning on investing in mining claims and buying tracts of timber when Charlie Utter, a friend of Wild Bill's, stopped in Cheyenne with 30 wagons that he had organized for a trip to Deadwood. Bill joined the wagon train and became a business partner with Utter. Another person that had joined the train was Martha Jane Canary, known locally as Calamity Jane. Also traveling with the wagons were several loads of prostitutes. It was said that in July 1876, when the wagon train arrived in Deadwood, that the miners lined the streets and broke out in a loud applause. Not for Wild Bill, but for the prostitutes. One whole block was designated for them. In the first few days, Bill tried panning for gold, but quickly gave it up. He found that most of the mining claims was taken up, and he soon decided that his future was at the card tables. Bill's favorite saloon in card games was at the Nuttle and Man's Number 10 Saloon. The original Number 10 burned down three years after Hickok was killed. However, if you go down these stairs, it'll take you to the original site and street location in 1876. Unfortunately, the place was a little dark and they charged extra to take you down to the cellar. On August the 2nd, 1876, Wild Bill Hickok walked into the Nuttles and Man Saloon looking for a card game that was always in progress. Today, Wild Bill will not be wearing his famous navy coats that he had used in so many gunfights. 
Instead, he was wearing a red sash around his waist, as he often did. And his Smith & Wesson Model II five-shot thirty-eight caliber Army revolver will be in his sash, wearing the handles reversed, as the cavalry military officers did. As Bill walked inside, he saw sitting at the card table Carl Mann, who was part owner of the saloon. Bill Massey, a Missouri steamboat captain, and Charlie Rich, with one chair empty, where a fourth person had just lost his stake and left. The empty chair was in front of the back door, not the front door as most believed. Bill asked Charlie Rich to change chairs with him as he was accustomed to sitting with his back to the wall. He had only been in Deadwood 28 days. Rich refused and said, Hell, Bill, you had not been here long enough and no one even knows that you're here. Bill reluctantly took the empty chair. A man by the name of Jack McCall had been watching Bill and seen his chance for revenge and fame. He had lost his money the day before to Wild Bill. Bill reportedly gave Jack enough money to eat on and said, Don't play if you can't afford it. Jack walked behind the bar to the inn where several men were standing talking. He went unnoticed and walked up behind Bill and pulled his forty-five revolver and shouted out, Damn you, take that! and shot Bill through the back of the head. Bill Massey, sitting straight across from Hickok, will receive the bullet in his left wrist. Carl Mann was sitting to Wild Bill's left and Charlie Rich on his right. Bill dropped his cards that he was holding a pair of black eights, and a pair of black aces. His fifth card is believed to have been a nine of diamonds. This hand will forever be known as the dead man's hand, aces and eights. Jack McCall will run out the door and try to mount a horse. The cinch had been loosened by the owner, so the saddle slipped off and he was unable to get on. So he runs down the street to a butcher shop where he was quickly caught by upset friends of Wild Bill's. There was no law in Deadwood and no jail. Jack was locked in the outdoor toilet long enough for the miners to form a miners court, which had no legal standing as Deadwood itself was not legal. Jack McCall's defense was that Wild Bill had killed his brother back in Hambleen, Kansas. The miners' court found Jack McCall's killing of Wild Bill Hickok justifiable after two hours' deliberation because Bill, they thought, had killed Jack's brother. After Jack leaves town, they all discovered that Jack McCall had no brothers. He'll be caught in Wyoming territory after bragging that he had killed Wild Bill in a fair fight. He'll be arrested by a U.S. Marshal and brought back to Dakota Territory and tried by a legal court and hanged. Jack McCall was buried with the rope still around his neck. James Butler Hickok was first buried at the Ingleside Cemetery in Deadwood by his friend Charlie Utter, shown here on the right. Two years later, his body, along with several others, will be moved up the hill to the new Mount Moriah Cemetery overlooking Deadwood. The town needed the land for expansion. James Butler Hickok, Wild Bill, was 39 years old. After Wild Bill's death, the Harper's Monthly magazine began writing fictitious stories about the romance between Wild Bill and Calamity Jane. They felt that the readers had rather hear about Bill and his romance with a 24-year-old gun-toting Calamity Jane instead of hearing about him writing love letters to his 50-year-old wife, Agnes. Jane had requested that she be buried next to Bill. She knew that it would secure her place in Western history. And on August the 1st, 1903, Martha Jane Canary passed away 
from stomach infection and pneumonia, believed to be from years of excessive drinking and rough living. Jane was 51 years old. Although Deadwood fathers knew that Wild Bill in life had little to do with Calamity Jane, Jane was well liked by Deadwood citizens for her unselfish work during the smallpox epidemic of 1878. Partly as a joke on Bill, and realizing that it would be good for tourism, the town leaders granted Jane's request to be buried next to Wild Bill Hecock. <laughs>